john at rte.ie How are you at the moment? Good? Yeah, good. Just back off a, off a tour uh, and I'm, uh, I couldn't believe yesterday when I landed. The weather. Just how nice it was. Yeah, I know. It's perfect. Do you miss home when you're away? You know, more and more, I used to, I used to always just sort of figure wherever you are is where you are, you know. Wherever you are, there you are. It's not this yeah. <laughs> um, But more and more lately, yeah, I, you know, I'm 43. I, I mean, it probably just doesn't have anything to do with age. It's just you come to a point where you start missing home more than you did before. And I am. And when I'm home, I'm really, uh, I'm really in it, you know, just in the garden and just turn off the phone and, uh, and just do a bit of work, you know. I like to do a little bit of carpentry and, you know, just give myself a couple of projects to do during the time I've got off and then I'm happy as Larry. Time to settle down, maybe. Could be. <laughs> Could be. That kind of feels, kind of feels a bit like that. I think I'm getting a bit clucky. <laughs> oh, yeah, cool. <laughs> Clucky yeah. for a couple of kids? I think a couple. Yeah. yeah. Ah, yeah. I mean, you know, we you know, we see. I mean, it's... Do you have the woman yet? I have a woman, yeah. She's great. Beautiful, beautiful girlfriend. And she, you know, it's... it's For me, it's, it's, it's... You know, I look at the people who I really admire, you know. I mean, for me, it, I mean, my heroes being, you know, the, the Leonard Collins, the Dillons, you know, Joni Mitchell and all, all of these great people that I read but you know not none of them are necessarily successful in the in the domestic in the personal lives yeah no not yeah. to not to put myself in any way in no, but just mates of mine you know all through the years mates of mine are getting married and having kids and it's great and I, and I you know and I'm really but for me it was always just music and I just couldn't I couldn't get my eye off it at all mm. and uh, I could never sit around long enough to even get in any way kind of broody you know Whereas lately I find myself enjoying more and more time off and taking, like I took a holiday for the first time last year and it was really, first time I ever took a holiday, it was actually two years ago now, uh, and it really opened my head because I consciously didn't think about anything, didn't think about music, didn't think about write, writing uh, in any description. And I was almost like, I was almost kind of afraid because it was, uh, I was like, geez, I don't think I ever want to go back to work. You, know? <laughs> you just enjoyed it so much. <laughs> I enjoyed it so much, yeah. So is the lucky woman Irish? Check. Check. Ooh. Mm. God, you went abroad to get the woman in your life no, again. Just, just coincidence, yeah. Just coincidence, yeah. <laughs> so does she know that you're ready for children? Ah, uh, yeah. I mean, we have yeah, we talk about all that stuff. Would you live here? Yeah, oh yeah. God, I'd have to live here, yeah. I mean, I, you know, I don't, I don't really live anywhere. I mean, I, me, like, I, you know, I, I rent a house here. Never bought it. Never bought it. It's probably a wise place. decision. Just, just <laughs> never, yeah. <laughs> I just always enjoyed renting because it's kind of, you know, you feel like there's a kind of a slight distance with it all. I live in a lovely house and I've got a lovely landlady. And, uh, you know, I can come and go as I please. But I always just kind of, I think I'd live between here and I lived in New York for the last few years and really enjoyed it. And then came home because I just thought, you know, like I was renting the place in New York and I was there just as little as, as I was here and the, the rent was insane. So I just was like, I, you know, I could probably you know just come here and stay in in a, in, a, in a hotel when i want to stay here but anyway so so i'm living here again and, but i don't really live anywhere particularly and i'm kind of pretty mellow wherever i go but i think if i was going to have kids it'd be ireland and probably probably czech or probably new york i read somewhere recently that you said that when you'd been away for a while in new york mm. you sometimes weren't that weren't that mad about coming back home maybe it was the drinking culture or yeah. that and some of you got sucked back into a way of life sometimes in Ireland and Dublin that you weren't mad about well it, you know that's to do with the that's to do with the rover you know the rover in us all and yeah. when you're on tour I mean I, it's funny I came home this week my mother saves the clips you know the newspaper <laughs> all the cuttings clip. yeah she's like you're in the newspaper this week here look and it's like it's so depressing because like the first piece she showed me was like it was something like my alcohol hell or whatever you know it was some <laughs> it was some piece and it was just like oh Jesus and it, and it was really just taken from an interview I did with Olaf Tillerson where yeah. I was talking about when you're on tour you, you know you're you're travelling around on a bus you're you're trying you know you do a gig you're all hyped up after the gig you have a couple of beers to kind of bring yourself down. And then you get on the bus and you get to sleep at like five or six in the morning. And you, wait, you know what I mean? And it, yeah. You kind of find yourself slipping into a routine of just like, you know, the gig is done, a couple of drinks with the lads. And I was saying, I was kind of, I guess I was kind of half joking, but maybe even the fact that I'm saying half joking is some kind of denial. So all the AA people out there now will totally have me pinned. But, you know, you come off tour and you sort of feel like you've entered mild alcoholism because mm. you're in, you know, 
you're kind of you've been drinking two or three or four pints every night for a month or six weeks and uh, and suddenly you're off and you're like geez I'd love a pint now you know and, <laughs> then, and then it sort of takes you a couple of weeks to get off that cycle and then before you know it sure you're and of course you know the other thing is being in, being a musician mm. and travelling especially in the States you're Irish so mm. everyone wants to give you whiskey you know you're getting handed Left right, and left right. You know, it's just it's just part of what people imagine Irish people to be, and it's a strange stereotype. And I, I don't, I'm not sure exactly where it came from. I guess it came from some of the music, and some of the cultural, you know, uh, refer like you know. I, I guess Shane hasn't done done a huge amount for. I mean, he's a, he's a he's a great man and a great writer, but you know that image of like I'm being that image of like the manky drunk Irish mm. poet, you know, is a is a very strong one in the world, mm. and so. Uh, and it's you know, still there. Yeah, it's still there. Yeah. And, you know, you find yourself sometimes falling into that character because it's actually kind of a comfortable place. Because, you know, it's that whole thing. The Irish defence mechanism is like sidestep, guffaw, slip into nonsense. And if you're kind of having a conversation with someone you don't really want to get quite that deep with, sure, you can always have a bit of crack. And, sure, <laughs> and, and then before you know it, you're not having the conversation. You're just kind of... Not from back. Oh, oh, the you know, when you're having it, you're, you know, you're, you're drinking or whatever. So it's a... It is an interesting one. Uh, but one you got to keep an eye on. I mean, the gargles, you know, especially in Ireland. I mean, it's it's a it's a bloody slippery slope. You know, you know they talk about all the drugs and all the rest. I mean, I really would love to see Ireland quit drinking for a year. See how we all got on. There'd be bloody revolution then. I'll tell you. Do you drink? Do oh, you, I do. Yeah, you do drink. Yeah, oh, yeah. but you're so aware of it. You're not. Going ah, yeah. To and my dad, a was, my dad yeah. was a like a proper. You know, my dad, proper alcohol. You know, died, well, you know, lived as he lived as he as he died drunk. Um, and I and I loved my father very very much. Great man, quiet, um, but a big drinker. And so I definitely those alarm bells go off pretty early, mm. you know, in all of us, you know, in all my brothers. So it's uh, does it mean you're all acutely aware of yeah. the dangers of yeah, the demon drink? Yeah, the demon drink. And you know, the other good news for us is that we have me ma's propensity for a hangover. Me <laughs> ma can only if me ma drinks one beer, she's, she's dying the whole next day. And so we all have that, which, which is, is good great. Because my dad never got hung over. He was never <laughs> hung over. He was grand. He was a boxer, you see. So he had that. He had that constitution, you know. Where did you get the musical talent from, him or her, your mum, your well, dad? Well, probably, probably from both. Really, my dad was a great singer. Uh, he, although music wasn't big in his family in the Hansard side, it wasn't like music. There wasn't much music in the family, but they all sang. They're all great singers. Uh, but on my ma's side, the Cals, they were uh, my uncle. You know, or as we refer to them when we were kids, our drunkles. But me, <laughs> me drunkle Paul. <laughs> no, no, Paul. Paul's not a big drinker. But but Paul, when we were kids, he was like my he was my hero, Paul Cal. He was like, he worked in the Abbey Theatre. I don't know what he did in the Abbey, but he worked in the Abbey and he played music in bars. Mm. And he, for me, was like, cool. my God. He was just like, because I obviously had him down as, and of course the family had him down as an actor. Yeah, he worked in the Abbey. You know, we were, the whole family was very proud of him because he was somebody doing stuff, you know, and it worked. And, uh, and Paul taught me a few chords and he, was, he really gave me the music and uh, taught me a few chords and a few songs and then took me into his band when I was like 12 or 13. I joined his band and we were playing in pubs all over the north side uh, like every night of the week. And so I, I got an amazing education. I got to watch, just to come back to the drinking again, you know, say we're sitting in, say, the Master Mariner on Eamon Street and it's like half seven and we're set up. And Paul, you know, we said, and then Paul would start playing. And like the, the, the atmosphere at half seven or eight o'clock in the evening was almost hostile. People sitting there with their arms folded, not talking to each other. A lot mm. of silence. And we'd be sitting there, trail on the sloop, John B. You know, like we're singing yeah. like Beach Boys songs or whatever and trying to get the. And then, of course, then you get to see the arc of the drunk. Over the course of the next three or four hours, cut to like closing time, and people are standing on tables, and you're not getting, you're not finishing yet. Play us another one, and like, and you've got the room, you know, and you've, you know, you're, and I'm still, of course, because I'm only a kid, I'm sober. Mm -hmm. I haven't, uh, I, I wasn't even, uh, wasn't drinking at all. Uh, and you're watching the crazy arc of like how we all relax, but we're just pouring the kaboom. pouring it into us. And then at the end of the night, everyone's having a great laugh and everyone, and everyone goes home and, you know, tears in their eyes and whatnot, you know, just fights outside. But then they come in the next evening and you set up your gear and it's half seven or eight o'clock and it's just, you know, I guess everyone's just in the horrors, but it's a funny thing. But it was a great education for me and Paul, the great songwriter, 
and uh, he kind of inspired me to, to, to sort of do that. And like, I'm, you know, I would all the people I was listening to when I was younger, you know, again the Dylans and the Van Morrisons and all the rest. I was I was trying to learn how to do all that. Uh, but he was the one. He was like the, my my hero. That's really nice. Yeah, Is it your mom's brother? Your mom's brother, Paul. Still around? Still around. He's brilliant. So he must be chuffed that you're going to be playing with Bruce Springsteen soon. It's funny because he sells the t-shirts outside. Oh, that's so sweet. Yeah, the last time I was at the Bruce gig, Paul was out selling the shirts, you know, the, the sort of unofficial, you know, just that, and, and it's brilliant, you know, because, you, you, know, you, you know, you get the, when you get the shirt off him. But there was, <laughs> Free, uh, I hope. Yeah, no, but there was one year, I think he'd spelt it wrong or something. <laughs> and it was a Springsteen one, I think he'd spelt Bruce or, or Springsteen wrong. wrong. I was like, I, everyone pointed out, I had, to, had to dump the whole lot of the t-shirts. But uh, no, he's a, he's a great man, great Great fella. You like Springsteen, don't you? Tell, there's a lovely story. First time you met Bruce Springsteen was when you were very young. Remember randomly, oh, you yeah. were busking. Yeah, I was, um, well, I lived out in Ballymun and I got the bus in the town, the 36, and the 36 would drop you on Parnell Square there, just, and you know, right beside the rotunda. And uh, I was coming past the Gresham. I used to walk past the Gresham with my guitar on my back, heading into town to do a bit of busking. Because nighttime busking was always better. He always made more money because again people were drunk, <laughs> so they were kind of a bit looser with their Cash. with their pockets and whatever. But uh, and I loved it, you know. I'd go into town and I always go to Grafton Street because the north side is where my ma was from. My ma sold fruit on Moore Street, and so I knew all the women on Talbot Street, and 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 so I wouldn't go into and you know yeah. Henry Street was a, was off limits for me because you know there's Glen, you know, I'd be like oh Jesus, you know, you wanted to kind of go off and make your own way of it. So Grafton yeah. Street was like this foreign, quite distant, posh, yeah, 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 distant place. Uh, so I was heading over to Grafton Street, but I was passing the Gresham one evening and I saw this big pink Cadillac. Now, anyone who kind of has photographs of that period, I think Bruce was all over MTUSA at the time. Uh, and there was a big pink Cadillac parked outside the, the Gresham and I'm looking at it. And I, and I saw, I kind of bumped into this guy just, just walking past me. And I was like, sorry, mate. And I had my guitar on me and he kind of gave me a tap like, and I was like, Jesus, it was Bruce. And he'd just gotten out of the car and it was, he was with people and they were kind of heading into the hotel. But I think he might have been playing some big gig. Might have been, would I have been slain? Might have been something else. But he was in Dublin anyway for something. And, you know, years and years later, you know, of course, he's an amazing, he's like, the, he's the great, he's, he's the kind of the great working, mm. working, working, working class. Like, he's kind of like the modern Woody Guthrie for mm. me. I mean, because Dylan had all that. Dylan was heading that way and then Dylan sort of went his own way. Fair play to him you know, had his own path and all. But Bruce, to me, really speaks to the people. You know, mm. he's, you know, not that Dylan doesn't, not that I think, but, but Bruce is very much concerned with the working man. Uh, and so he's always a big hero of ours. You know, and when we were kids in Ballymun, it was like Marley, Luke Kelly, Dylan, Springsteen. It was always people who, you know, mm. whereas nowadays it's Dempsey. And, yeah. you know, it's, 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 the, it's the great heroes of, of the working man, you know. So years later... After we did once and all the rest, and, and you'd won the Oscar, we'd won the won the Oscar, and we were and I was at a Bruce gig in the RDS, and an amazing thing happened. Someone from his crew recognised myself and Marquetta were standing in the audience, and we were just there waiting for Bruce to come on. And they must have gone back and said something, and then word came out, "Do you want to come back and say hello to Bruce? He'd, he'd like to congratulate you on your success." So Jesus, we went back, and you know Bruce was there, and it was like fifteen minutes before stage, you know, and. Uh, he said hello and, you know, gave Marquette and myself a big hug and we chatted for like moments about, you know, he was like, oh, you know, welcome to the club, Bob's got one, you, you know, now you've got one, how does it feel? You know, just like, just kind of shooting, you know, mm -hmm. hanging out and talking. And uh, we watched the gig, they invited us onto the side of the stage and we watched a bit from there and then we went back out front because we wanted to feel the real power of him coming off the, the front. But then afterwards they invited us back Party. For, for, for a drink, for a quiet drink because, you know, Bruce has just left it all on stage. I mean, he does like a four-hour gig mm. and he's, you know, he's knackered, you know. We went back to the hotel and, and uh, God, I, I was blown away. He sat up with us like for hours and hours and hours. Mm. I don't know what time it was when we left eventually, but uh, chatting away just about chatting. music. And he gave you that advice. I don't know, because I think he's brilliant, but the, remember the advice he said to you that you're now a different person. Bury the old land since you've won this Oscar. I wasn't sure about well, that. Well, no, it wasn't, it wasn't quite like that, because I yeah. wouldn't agree with that advice either. No, what he said, I guess I was battling with something. Uh, and it's tough to explain this without coming, without coming off like an, an EJ, but I'm gonna, I'll try. Success is a, is a, like, okay, with the frames, you spend... It was, what was it, like it was like 15 years in the frames. And you're always, 
you know, every time someone new comes along and buys a record of yours, you're so happy. Yeah. It's one other person you've won. It's like, it's like, it's for the want of a better word, it's like struggle. You're like, you're struggling. Yeah. It's you against the world, you and your band against the world. And, you know, everybody, every time you do a gig and there's a few more people, it's a major success. We're all delighted. And then, and you're always hoping for success. But then when it actually does come, when success actually kind of, when the world eventually turns around and says, okay, what? What do you want? We're listening. And suddenly, you know, you, instead of selling, you know, 5,000 copies of your record, you've sold a million copies of your record. It's yeah. gone to that place where it's crossed over into a much, much bigger thing, which the one soundtrack sold, I think it sold 900, whatever it was. Yeah. It was close to a million, if not a million, uh, which was unbelievable for us. And the, I guess what I'm trying to say is that wh when that moment happened, I kind of lost contact with who I was. I, even though that would, you know, it's like, what happens when you get everything you've always asked for? Yeah. You know, everything's supposed to, it's like winning the lottery. What happens yeah. when you do actually win the lottery? Your life changes dramatically overnight. N whether you like it or not, you know. And that's kind of what it was like. We won the lottery, we won an Oscar. What the, where did that come from? What was that about? It was amazing. But, what, what, you know, it wasn't, that was never part of my plan. trajectory or yeah. plan. Or, or, and it was such an incredible thing. But I couldn't figure out why I was feeling so sad, even though I was meant to be celebrating and, so mm -hmm. happy and I was kind of ex talking to him about this and he he just said the most he said he just so eloquently so he said well if you think about it the guy you've been all this time is has now been validated he's actually been kind of graduated into someone else so now you go from being the guy who's you know you against the world and yet that's a very strong position a lot of yeah. people can't leave that position a lot of people don't want to leave that position the struggle yeah, yeah. they're not actually interested in success they're interested in struggle it's what they're about and so when success actually comes and says, all right, this is what you've been looking for, it's yours. A lot of people throw it away and, and mm -hmm. sabotage it or hit the gargle or go on drugs or because they're sabotaging their own success. Mm -hmm. And you see it in all walks of business, not just in the arts. You see it all along the way. It's like a lot of people are born to not succeed, but to try. And then really su interesting. success is something they'll avoid. So did oh. his words to you actually help you? It was, well, what he said was so just potent because he said, look, it's like you're wearing a new set of clothes now. Now you're no longer uh, the dude with a guitar and a few songs. You're now your man out of once. You know your man who wrote that song. You know you're now yeah, the someone. The guy who won the Oscar. Yoy. Like, yeah. And so, and so, his point was: part of your old self has died, and you're mourning the passing of your old self. And don't worry about it. Just mourn it. If you're feeling weird, feel weird. Just be where you are. And I remember just thinking, Jesus, that's a, like that just gave me a kind of a reason to just sit back and go, you know what, that is brilliant advice. Because then he was talking about, you know, I don't want to talk too much about what, what his word, but he was talking about when, when you know, when the river mm. broke and his career broke and he came to London and of course, you know, on the seats of every, every seat in the Apollo in London, his first show in London had like the next Bob Dylan written on a flyer on every seat. Of course, he came and was so embarrassed by this that he wouldn't. He held the doors, took every flyer off every sea, and said, "Don't, don't do this to me. Yeah. Let me win my own audience. Don't make something of me that I'm not. Let me go." You know, and, and mm. Bruce's thing is, you've never, you've never, you've never made it. This whole thing of like, "Oh, you've made it now. You've never made it. You're making it all the time. Every time you play a gig, every time you play a song, you're making it. You've never earned it. It's not yours. You know, you get to hold on to it for a minute." Which is why he gives so much of the gig. I think so. And you do yeah. long gigs now too. We do long gigs, yeah. yeah you yeah. and the frames. You go now with an 11 piece band, including the frames, aren't you? Yeah, long? yeah. Just because the record kind of dictated that it, it should have some strings and some brass. And it's been a lovely, it's been a lovely period of time uh, touring with this band because it's, there's so many people. It's been really creative, actually. You also have to be grateful to the sea area forecast on <laughs> RT Radio. <laughs> Tell people why. <laughs> well... I, it's funny how how song titles come to you sometimes, but the sea area forecast is something like, you know, there's parts of the radio, there's parts of Irish, the RTE radio one, that I still find absolutely mystical. The sea area forecast being being one of them. Just this strange bunch of figures and then these strange words that mean so much to some people, but I've never quite understand, you know, uh, like, you know, uh, uh, Tusker Lighthouse, uh, you know, I mean, I'm going to get it, I'm going to get it totally wrong, but like, uh, uh, 
Mizenhead to Mal, Mizenhead to Mal, it's like 71, uh, <laughs> rising slowly or falling slowly, which was what actually tweaked my. I remember thinking, what a lovely term, falling slowly. And I knew it had something to do with pressure and air pressure and the ocean and all the rest. And I just thought, what a lovely, what a lovely thought. And so I took the term falling slowly and I, and it was just knocking around my head. And when I was, uh, when I was writing that song, I found that term spilling yeah. out of my mouth and, and, it, and somehow it made total sense to the song. So yeah, Falling Slowly is named after the, uh, the Sierra forecast. Who <laughs> would have known? It's <laughs> yeah. so cool. But look, you yeah. obviously still love what you do. You're heading off on loads of gigs. Yeah. Um, we were saying today, it's nice, we're sitting in the open air and you're here really effectively on your own. Like you haven't changed, you haven't come with a big crew of people to mind you. No. <laughs> I know, but a lot of people come with a good few people. I kind of understand why some people feel they need that safety blanket and they feel they need the safety of their friends and and some kind of you know because you're walking into a situation and you're talking you know you're talking openly in an interview situation you know I, I there might have been a point in my past where I might have been like that but I I just have never been just by probably pure chance uh I, but then again on tour you do need protection you know you need some you need people to be that buffer between you and and the, and the audience only in moments when you're on stage and you're doing your gig, you don't need any buffer. What you need is the audience to be right there and everyone, and you need to be right there with them and be present. But there are times when, you know, and it's totally normal when you're, you know, you're wrecked, you know, and you've got no energy left in you and you don't necessarily have any words for anybody and you want to just go and, you know, and just sit sit on your own. And th th at moments like that, it doesn't, it doesn't do any harm to have someone who just says, you know, and you don't want anyone to be a dick on your behalf, but you yeah. want them to, you want them to just protect you because sometimes when you're tired your skin can get thin you know and someone even even the nicest comment in mm. passing can can really spear you you know yeah. so in a way sometimes you need a bit of space so I can you know so if someone shows up with an entourage of people you know I can kind of I kind of get why that is you know I'm glad you don't though I don't do it you said you wanted to spend more time with your brothers and your mum as well when you were away yeah. are you getting to do that yeah I am getting to do that and you know one of the things that I've really gotten very fond of and it's you know it's a luxury that everybody you know everyone listening to the radio now gets to do every day I don't get to do it every day so for me it's a very pleasant thing which is just cooking dinner I cook mm. dinner and I, I like I've gotten you could quite, cook I've gotten quite into cooking like mm. you know because it's something which is still kind of a novelty to me because you know being a musician you spend so much of your time traveling and eating in other people's kitchens which sounds very glamorous but yeah. believe me it, it gets boring you know it's, it's it's nice to be able to cook your own meal and see what's going into it and see where see who you and feed people you know and feed your family so it's a big thing for me so when i'm home i have a whole thing of like i'm cooking every day and god your mom must be delighted yeah it's brilliant <laughs> heading down to super queen uh and getting all the gear <laughs> well look you've loads of upcoming gigs uh ivy gardens july the 21st in dublin big top and galway and july the 25th that's part of the galway arts festival yeah. they're great they've so much on your friend amy dempsey will be yeah. there and then of course with bruce springsteen at nolan park and kilkenny Looking forward to that one. Yeah, you sure will. I'd be there anyway, you know. It'd be nice to play a few songs and then go sit in the, sit in the grass. And yeah, but it must still be. Do you pinch yourself sometimes and think, hey, I'm actually up here supporting Bruce Springsteen? Yes, all it's, the time. Yeah. Mm, it's unbelievable. But great. <laughs> Amazing. Yeah. But look, you're going to thanks, Moon, for chatting to me. Thank you. John at rte.ie.